to today's web seminar. Thanks for joining us. This is Simone Turek with John Burton Advocates for Youth. And today we are going to share with all of you about a pilot project uh, working with transitional housing providers to really improve their capacity to support current and former foster youth in college. Um, and so just this morning, we released a report about the project. So I invite you to all please check that out. It's on our, our website and I'll also be sending it out to all of you um, when we end the webinar. And uh, so we'll talk about kind of the findings that are included in that report. And um, we'll also be launching a, a two-year project as the next kind of phase of this. And so you'll hear just a little bit about that um, as well. So next, I would just like to bring your attention to kind of the, the technical information to participate. Um, we always recommend uh, calling in versus listening to your computer speaker through your computer speakers if you encounter any audio issues. Um, if you do, that usually will fix fix them. Um, and then we always post uh, our web seminar recordings. This is being recorded. Um, and a copy of the slides on the John Burton Advocates for Youth website. And this will also be on the THP Plus website. All right. And so today, um, we are joined by Stephanie Molina with Edgewood Center for Children and Families. Um, Stephanie is the Kinship Resource Coordinator and THP Plus Case Manager. And we're also joined by Ashley Rarick, who is the THP Plus Supervisor at Bill Wilson Center. And so as I mentioned, um, I'll be talking about what, what this pilot consists of and what we've learned from it and where we're headed. And Stephanie and Ashley will be sharing about kind of the, the transformations that their programs have really embarked on. Um, and then you'll finally, like I said, hear a little bit about um, what we have planned next. So uh, this is a little bit of background for, for people. In 2010, as you all probably know, uh, Assembly Bill 12, the Fostering Connections uh, to Success Act passed. And this changed the age that youth can remain in foster care from 18 to 21. Um, and in making the case for what we call extended foster care, um, advocates emphasize the opportunity to improve college outcomes for foster youth by supporting them during the difficult transition from high school graduation into college, um, thereby increasing their rate of college retention, completion, and ultimately their long-term economic security, right? Okay, great. However, uh, you know, I don't think we really, really fully understood what this meant for the child welfare system, right? Um, it, it sounded good. It was, it, it was a, a wonderful um, kind of direction and, and goal for extended foster care. But what did this really mean for us? And, you know, it meant that on the child welfare side, we really had to become just as versed on and as involved with higher education as we are with K through 12, right? because now um, foster care overlaps with college. Uh, college and foster care didn't overlap before foster care was extended to age 21 um, in most cases. Um, but now there's this definitive overlap, you know, foster youth are college age. Um, and what this provides is really a tremendous opportunity to change the post-secondary educational outcomes of foster youth, of current and former foster youth, um, which we all, kind of very well know um, have not been good. And, and I didn't do a slide on what those outcomes are. I think we've all seen them many times. Um, and as you see on the screen, uh, preliminary data you know, uh, suggests that youth in fact may be experiencing improved college outcomes. When you look at what's on there, um, you know, we, we unfortunately don't have the data on foster youth college enrollment rates prior to 2012-13, just because there wasn't a, a foster youth flag in the data systems, but if you look at 2012-13, which is the first year foster care was, the first year it was implemented um, in 2012, and compare it to the academic, you know, 2015-16 academic year, you see the increase in community college enrollment is significant. Um, 22,866 jumped up to 27,061, right? Um, and we also know from the Cal Youth Study that Chapin Hall conducting that youth who remain in extended foster care are more likely to be enrolled in college, enrolled full-time, and more likely to receive financial aid than youth who exited. So um, that's, that's great, right? Um, these are really positive early indications. Um, but we think important questions remain. Um, <clears throat> is remaining in foster care enough to improve college outcomes, or is it necessary 
to change the practice of providers serving the population to increase their emphasis on college enrollment and retention. What are providers serving transition age current and former foster youth currently doing to support college enrollment and retention? What additional kind of core practices can be added um, to promote college enrollment and retention? And then lastly, what barriers exist um, preventing providers from implementing these practices? And it's important to note that, you know, we've seen this increase in enrollment, but what, you know, we don't know that we're seeing improved retention or completion. And that's really the end goal, right? It's this long-term stability that comes from completing some sort of either certificate, license, degree, um, something that will put you in a better place uh, career-wise. So we launched a pilot project, as I mentioned, um, to both learn more and to really foster a conversation among the child welfare sector about how to go beyond these, what we call kind of safety net services and really affect post-secondary education um, outcomes. Uh, transitional housing providers are very uniquely positioned, right? They're, they're close to the youth, they're providing case management on a daily and a weekly basis, um, and they really have an ability um, to make a difference with youth. Um, you know, their housing at the moment is taken care of. Um, it's important for youth to, to, you know, it's an opportunity for them to really focus on college before they're entirely independent. That's kind of the preface for this. And then, you know, who participated in the pilot? I, I just did one slide on this. There's actually a list of the 28 programs that participated in this pilot with us in the report in one of the appendices. So you can take a look at the report to see that. But just an overview, you can see kind of geographically, providers were pretty representative compared to the overall number and location of, of THP Plus and THP Plus FC providers statewide. Excuse me. <clears throat> you can see that that's kind of um, what the overall provider landscape does look like geographically. And then uh, most of the providers operated both programs, um, THP Plus and THP Plus FC, 17 of the 28 operated both. Um, and for those unfamiliar with what these programs are, just real quick, THP Plus FC is a foster care placement for youth participating in extended foster care, so they're ages 18 to 21. And then THP Plus is a long-time program for former foster youth ages 18 to 24, but really the majority are 21 to 24 now in THP Plus because the younger youth are staying in extended foster care. Um, and both programs, <clears throat> excuse me, offer housing and supportive services to youth. And then collectively, you know, and everyone wants to obviously know what, 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 what the numbers are here. Collectively, the programs serve 757 youth, these 28 programs, 757 youth across 24 counties. So where were we at baseline, right? What was the college enrollment level or rates at baseline? Um, how many youth were enrolled in college? So the first thing to note is the majority of the youth that were in the program participating in the pilot had completed high school. So then as far as college enrollment, if you kind of pull out the small handful of youth in their programs that have already achieved degrees, you'll see that in THP Plus, 41% were enrolled in college, which includes, by the way, career and technical education programs offered at the community colleges, just to be clear. Um, and in THP Plus FC, it was nearly 34%. And then when you look at the programs together, nearly 38%. Um, and in September of this year, we'll be gathering this data again and seeing if there has been any collective change in enrollment rates. So where we started kind of practices at baseline. So what were these programs doing um, before participating in the project? Because many of them were doing things to support youth in college already, obviously. Um, so what were those things? Um, so after we kind of, uh, so we, we had programs take this, this, pro, this assessment, this baseline assessment, um, and the next several slides, you're going to see the results from the baseline assessment. And for the purpose of time and not being too boring, I'm not going to go into each one with you. Um, this is something you can look, in more, at, look at in more depth in the report. Um, but I'll just highlight a few things that we thought were notable um, and that informed what we worked on over the course of the pilot. And of course, I should disclaimer here, um, each program is different and unique. And so when I make these generalizations, I'm not saying every program, but I'm saying that these were the findings about the group as a whole. So first, you know, while providers regarded post-secondary education as important, that was very clear, it was not the primary focus of their work, right? Because they're, they're housing providers. So, so they, they're housing providers. 
Um, so more than two out of three of the programs tracked data on post-secondary ed outcomes, which is great. Um, but just 4%, for example, had funding specifically focused on supporting post-secondary ed related work. Um, we also noted that there was more of a focus on enrollment. It was the most kind of, kind of common data collected um, than retention. And then what we found over the course of the pilot, that you'll hear about later, you know, is really, this was a common theme. Providers expressed that retention is a significant challenge. It's really difficult to, to help youth um, persist from semester to semester or from year to year. And providers were very eager for new ideas from one another, kind of what do you do to support retention, right? So, uh, so this data here, this really showed, you know, most providers track the individual academic progress of their youth for, in their case management. So what, what we mean by this is they had youth provide their transcripts or their midterm and final grades to their case managers. And the purpose of this is really to be able to help youth troubleshoot when, when a crisis arises early on to avoid, um, avoid it from, from becoming a real issue. And the process by which providers tracked progress really ranged. And so while two out of, well, um, several of them you know, did um, track, say they tracked progress. What we, what we learned was that depending on how they tracked progress, this made a big difference and many expressed challenges with actually getting this information. We also learned um, that providers had limited knowledge about assessment tests, which are part of the matriculation process at community colleges and CSUs, and the impact these tests can have on youth academic careers is significant. So this was an important thing for us to, to learn. Um, next, the baseline assessment also told us providers regarded um, assisting youth with financial aid as very important, which is great, um, but we did learn from programs that, you know, that many desired more education about the financial aid process, which we all know is really, can be really complicated. Um, so next, you can see that here that providers generally had kind of a li more limited, generally speaking, more limited relationship with the local colleges, foster youth campus support programs. The first five rows you see on the screen um, are were a spectrum. We asked people to kind of place themselves on, like where did they fall? And although the single largest group is the top one, um, it's still only 37% that indicated that they have strong relationships with foster youth contacts at all or most of the campuses in their community and regularly refer youth to them. And we really want everyone to be in that category, right? And then lastly, you know, providers um, lacked training protocol to equip their case managers with the knowledge they needed to support youth in college. So you see here only 22% employed an education specialist, which is fine. Um, but what it means is the remaining 78% really needed case managers who were well-versed on post-secondary ed, but only 41% total were providing training on this topic to their direct service staff. So for me, that was really telling, like, what do we need to focus, you know, the project on? Um, so what was provided? So it consisted of training, technical assistance, peer learning, really, and financial assistance for youth in the program. And uh, these things were delivered by way of kind of what you see on the screen. I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a second. But first, I want to talk about this core practice model. In the beginning of the project, we introduced a core practice model of eight practices or program elements that kind of, if providers adopted, could potentially transform themselves into college support programs. Um, and this model was based on what we've learned from working with the post-secondary education side of things and working with the child welfare side of things. So we've kind of had a lot of learning there and, and it's also based on what data tells us. So this is the core practice model in summary. And if you want a more uh, detailed version of this, go visit the report and it's in the appendices as well. But I'm gonna just talk about a few of these things very briefly. The first one, intensive academic focus case management or coaching, you know, what is that? It's a lot. I'll say just a couple things. Um, it's tracking academic progress of each youth on your caseload. It's being hands-on, so you know, accompanying youth to meetings on campus. It's knowing their class schedule. It's helping them, you know, navigate their their schedule as a whole and prioritizing how to make school work. It's it's helping them make decisions that won't jeopardize their ability to finish school. Um, it's it's many things, as I said. Um, so second, ensure youth have access to tutoring and other academic support. I'm not going to go into this. It's pretty straightforward. Number three, develop a college-going culture. This is a little more vague, right? It seems a little more mysterious. Like, how do you just develop a culture? What does that mean? 
Um, there are so many actually very low barrier things that you can do in your program that make a huge difference. The simplest thing is just changing the physical space of your program, putting up college swag all over your office or all over the common space. Have a Hall of Fame wall um, of those youth who have gone through your program that end up graduating. You know, have them come back and talk to you. Have college themed events. Have campuses come talk to these. You know, there's so many more things you can do. I won't name for the sake of time, but take a you know take a look at at the report to find out more. Uh, number four, minimize the work obligation. So the most significant piece of this is really making sure youth are receiving maximum financial aid, and then beyond that. You know, for THP Plus programs, for example, it's, uh, you know, you usually pay a portion of the rent, right? So can you structure your program that maybe youth in college have a discounted rent? Um, for both programs, maybe it's, are you providing enough of a living stipend? Are you helping youth who work get work study as opposed to some, you know, random job that doesn't understand what it's like to be a student? Or are you helping them get flexible jobs that are good for students? Um, number five, establish a close working relationship with all local campus support programs. So this helps in so many ways. We really learned more even over the course of the project. Um, one, it makes sure youth in your program are accessing campus support, that's obvious, but it also helps your youth if you have um, a productive relationship with information flow on both sides in both directions. So this usually means using a waiver signed by both programs, for, you know, and your youth, um, and it really uh, I'll talk about this more later, and I think our, one of our presenters probably will too, but you can learn more about this in our March 2017 webinar that we did if you're, if you're curious. Um, number six, ensure all youth complete FAF, the FAFSA and financial aid process from start to finish and maintain their aid. This is huge. I won't go into detail here. There's too much to talk about. But I will just say that the, ma the maintaining aid piece is so significant but so challenging for people um, to, to help youth kind of learn and do. Um, and so uh, for more information on this, you can visit our October 2016 webinar and our April 2017 webinar that both focus on financial aid. Um, and the last, or the second to last one, assisting youth with avoiding unnecessary placement in remediation and accessing best options for addressing remediation needs. So this one is, um, there's kind of a lot here. And I'll just say, you know, foster youth are more likely to be placed in below transfer level courses, also referred to as basic skills or remedial courses, um, in the community college system than non-foster youth, okay? And the data show that when youth, particularly foster youth, are placed in remediation, they're less likely to go on to complete a transfer level course and ultimately finish their educational goal. Some colleges use what's referred to as multiple measures, which is using variables other than just the assessment test um, to kind of assess a student's need for remediation. And this has been found to lead to placement in one or more courses higher than the current assessments are doing. And then the other piece of this to know is that some colleges use alternate strategies for delivering remedial coursework should a youth be placed in remedial coursework, course level, um, that produce more promising outcomes than the traditional method of requiring completion of several levels of remediation prior to placement and transfer level coursework. So this is really what this, this seventh practice here is. It's about helping youth prepare for the assessment test and take it seriously because it's important, and then helping them navigate the outcome of that test. And for more info on this, you can visit the February 2017 webinar. And then lastly, the eighth thing here, collect data on post-secondary ed outcomes and make data-driven decisions. This is very straightforward. I won't talk about this. Um, moving on, so how did we learn, how did providers learn about all these practices? So we did monthly webinars on what we thought kind of the key topics were, and particularly the more technical topics like financial aid, and you'll see what they are on the screen there, and all of these webinars, these past webinars are available. I'm sure many of you joined us on some of these are available on our JBay website under the training archive, okay? Um, individual and small group technical assistance. You know, we provided this guidance kind of through individual and conference calls, and these had a few different purposes. Learn from your peers. Um, I helped with the development of, you know, documents for tools that might have been needed. Um, we talked through individual goals and activities and um, how to access outside support if need be. Um, In-person convening. So we had, or we've had two convenings. We'll have a third one coming up, as you can see there. 
Um, the the in-person convening provided also like a really great platform for peer sharing, and we did considerable work talking about the core practice model and talking about the program's plans. Um, in October, like as I said, we'll be having our final convening, and it'll be a pre-conference session at this year's Blueprint Conf for Success Conference. This is a large-scale conference we put on um, every other year, focused on foster youth and higher education, and this is part of the California College Pathways Project. Really amazing conference. I mean, really, really, really great conference. And if you're interested in attending, you should visit blueprintconference.org. Sorry, that's not on the screen there. And then lastly, just these, what we call college retention grants. You know, these were one-time grants for youth in the participating programs who are attending college for up to $400. We would provide uh, one time. We provided 67 students at 41 different college campuses grants totaling a little over 26,000 um, in total. And the most interesting thing here was nearly half of all grants, as you can see, went to transportation-related expenses. That's pretty significant. So I just thought I'd share that. And now I am happy to stop talking and turn it over to Stephanie Molina with Edgewood to talk about her experience participating in the pilot project. So please um, take it away, Stephanie. Thank you, Simone. Uh, hello, everyone. I am excited to be here and talk to you a little bit about our THP Plus program at Edgewood. Um, so as some of you may or may not know, Edgewood is a really, really big company uh, in Northern California. And as you can see on the screen, uh, we provide an array of services um, ranging from school-based behavioral health, uh, wraparound services. I'm also a case manager for a kinship um, program in San Francisco. And um, so you can see the list of different services that we provide. So we're fairly well known in, um, in the Bay Area. Um, so today we will focus our attention on our transitional housing program plus um, in San Francisco. So we currently serve um, former foster care young adults who um, were part of San Francisco County. And so um, we follow the uh, THP plus host county model. So meaning that um, they are young adults live with a kin adult, um, meaning someone that they consider family as long as it's not their biological parent. Um, so for the most part, they either live in San Francisco or they've moved to the East Bay. And currently we have um, two case managers who work out in the East Bay and three that, that work um, in San Francisco. Um, and we have 10 young adults in total um, in both um, areas, and we work with 18 to 25 year olds. Technically, THP is uh, 21 to 25, um, but we just this new fiscal year we opened it to 18 to 21 year olds, um, and they do not have to be dependents of the county um, or have had any past with um, foster care, um, but they are more than welcome to come into our workshop and receive a small stipend for their participation just to get them prepared for uh, the real world and becoming an adult. Uh, we also provide one-on-one -on -one life skills case management. Um, so this, um, we had actually started our THP Plus program um, before AB12. So we had um, a limited time um, to help them become independent, quote unquote independent and um, become adults. Um, and so we had, um, we had to build on their life skills um, that's part of the county requirements. We're focusing a little bit more on finances, um, finding apartments, finding housing, um, how to become, um, you know, better parents, um, and uh, focus on education if it was part of their goal. All right, next slide. Um, so why did we want to transform our THU plus program? Um, so we found that college provides a greater opportunity for youth lives. Um, as part of creating their careers and their future, um, especially when it comes to the professional world. Um, and they often have uh, more options for networking um, and the place for self-discovery. And it also creates a sense of personal accomplishment. Um, so college has become a place of their own controlled experience for success. And it also uh, paves the path for role models uh, for their families. Um, as role models for the families, uh, their peers in the community. So we've often asked um, our young adults why they're going to college, and for the most part, um, they said that they're first generation uh, to graduate, 
and to even attend. So we want to make sure that they um, they continue and get their diploma and 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 feel feel successful. Um, and oftentimes they're they're talking about um, grad school, um, so we're very excited about that. Next slide. So where did we start? Um, so we first, I was actually one of the first case managers um, when we received THC Plus uh, from the county. And so our focus, our main focus was to teach um, independence. Um, again, we received um, uh, a list from the county um, of different things that we wanted, that they wanted us to focus on. Um, a lot of our younger adults during that time really just wanted a job. Um, they didn't really want to go to college. Um, it was an option, um, but nowadays um, things have changed, so um, we have to change our focus as well. Um, and so now our young adults that we're working with um, are already kind of coming in with a little bit more independent skills than we're used to. Um, so that means that we had to switch our focus. And right now, um, the majority of them um, are in either part-time or full-time school and also part-time or uh, full-time um, working. So that's why we wanted to change our focus um, to make sure that they do graduate, to make sure that they do become role models for their family. Um, so right now we have 94.7% um, of our young adults have graduated from high school and are in college. So again, wanted to change our focus and make sure um, that that they that they are successful. Uh, so right now we have young adults in city colleges, um, state colleges, and some vocational. So next slide. Um, so what goals did we set? So with um, the eight core practices, we wanted to kind of start fresh. Um, so we had to begin by prioritizing our strengths um, and seeing what skills that we had as case managers um, for our short-term goals. And um, the long-term goals as well um, definitely want to focus on uh, for the future. So they are um, something that we contemplated, but we wanted to focus on the short-term goals and what we can do first. Next slide. So this is going to be the uh, main page of focus. Um, so I want to focus on the um, on the three on the two um, utilizing practices that we're doing now. Um, and then one goal that we are um, that we're partially utilizing. So the first one is the educational um, focus on case management. And so as I mentioned before, we didn't have too many um, educational focused goals unless it was um, stated by the young adults in their assessment. So unless it was something that they wanted to focus on, that's what we were focused on. Um, so now with this. Um, with this new year, um, the post-secondary education and after the PSEP, we are now um, focusing our gears and um, we're collecting uh, quarter or semesterly class schedules in order to just be a little bit more informed of their lives um, and in what we can help them with. Um, so we're asking them to bring them into our sessions um, and we just started during the summer, so some of them are attending summer school. And some of them are already planning for fall. So we're asking for those um, schedules for them so we can just be a little bit more informed um, and follow up with them. So the lesson that we've learned here um, is that case managers need to just have a little bit more of a creative path in order to help them focus um, the goals that we can have, that we can create together. Um, so the second one that we're focusing on is the college going culture in our program. Um, so Right now, something that's uh, really exciting for us is um, actually just um, um, pushed for like a visually creating a college information board in our office space. Um, because we do work in a family center, we have a lot of um, family information, we have um, kinship information, but I noticed that we don't necessarily have uh, college THP plus information. So just recently I got that approved. So I'm really excited for that in the future. Um, so just wanting to have a visual um, bulletin where we can post about open house um, options. We can post about scholarships that are coming up and especially financial aid deadlines. Um, anything that is pertinent for their college education. Um, and also we're currently 
Um, I'm in the process right now to collect um, all of our staff, like all the modern flags, and so I'm kind of um, collecting those to, to place them around. And if um, you know anyone who comes into our family center has questions um, about a certain college, they can go to the staff, and, and I'm sure they would be more than happy to have a conversation about about their experience in college. So we're wanting to, to encourage that, and um, we're also wanting to encourage. Um, case managers to attend the uh, San Francisco Foster Youth and Higher Education Group at Bennett City College. Um, and I went last month and it was really great to meet other um, foster care and higher education providers. Um, that way we can share information together and be able to collaborate and share um, some of the work together. So very exciting to meet um, Oregon scholars, providers, and um, be able to network with them. So more on that um, in the future, um, future collaboration. And the third one that I wanted to focus on is um, the, the third to last one, to ensure youth complete financial aid process from start to finish and assist in maintaining their aid. So that one is um, big for me just because, um, you know, if financial aid is an issue, young adults are gonna go to work. Um, and they're not going to focus so much on their on their school, and so we want to make sure that they get as much financial aid as possible. So they're not stressing, especially in San Francisco now that the rent is really really high, um, and the cost of living is really really high, even in the Bay Area. Um, so we're just wanting to ensure that financially they're a little bit more safer, um, and that way we can um, help them um, receive as much financial aid as possible. So our current goal um, is actually going to start on August 2nd. Um, so we're, I put together a meeting um, in order to train all of our PHP um, case managers on financial aid options. Um, so that is going to be the last, uh, past webinars that we've, um, that we've learned from because of our PSET training. So um, that's, that's the start. So we're really excited about that. Um, just during it during the summer, so for the fall when it does come time to do applications, we're a little bit more prepared. Um, and we're also wanting to obviously increase the staff knowledge. The more that the staff know about financial aid and the Chasey grants and how to do all of those applications, the more um, that the young adult will know how to use them. So I want to get everyone on the same page. Um, and I've also created a financial aid checklist for the young adults to complete with the case managers um, for anything that they've filled out in regards to financial aid, whether it be scholarships, or the Chasey grant or the Pell grant. Um, and they do have to show proof to their case managers and the uh, case managers do have to sign off. Um, we will still continue to include um, financial aid in our monthly workshop topics. And we've broken down our workshop topics um, every month into three categories. So one is uh, like the self-care portion. Um, the other is an educational portion where it can include any um, a range of topics in regards to their education and then the life skills. So we're not excluding life skills, we're still incorporating them um, into our workshops every single month. Um, and we're possibly thinking of doing a financial aid um, workshop for caregivers as well um, and anyone involved in the financial aid process for uh, the young adults um, so we can get more of a more attendance um, and more knowledge. The more that we know, the, the better. Um, and of course, taking advantage of John Burnett's kids youth grants. Um, so we had a young adult who did participate um, in the retention grant and she received $100 for summer school since um, the financial aid, since it didn't, it wasn't covered for her. So she was able to uh, take advantage of that and, and go to summer school. So this is her last year. Um, and she's hoping to graduate um, next winter actually. So um, luckily she was able to take summer school and didn't have to push uh, for another semester in school, which obviously meant um, you know, putting in more money. So luckily she was able to, to bypass, um, you know, stretching her time for another semester. Um, and, uh, and we are looking into the textbook support as well. So we have a, a list of young adults who want to participate in that. Um, so we're very, very excited about what the next year is going to look like. Well, thank you. And I'll save questions for the end. Thank you, Stephanie. And we and we already have questions uh, 
pouring in. Um, and that reminds me, and I think I forgot to mention this in the beginning of the presentation, that if you do have questions, please, um, please send them in. Um, so if you haven't done so, you can do that in your question box and we will save them for the end. We'll do a little Q&A at the end. Um, thanks, Stephanie, for sharing um, and being, you know, just transparent about what you're working on and where you're headed. And we're really excited to see where you guys continue to kind of land and, 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 and work toward um, over the course of the next year and years. All right. Thank you. Um, so thank you. So let's um, turn it over if my mouse would work. Let's see. Here we go. Turn it over to Ashley Rarick. Ashley's with Bill Wilson Center and she's now going to share about her experience um, in the participating in the pilot project. Okay, with fingers crossed that everyone can hear me. Yes. Is it true? Um, let's get someone, if someone can just message in and, and let us know you can still hear Ashley. We had a little bit of trouble in the beginning. Yes, they can hear you. So okay. go right ahead. Thanks, everyone. Well, it is uh, an honor to be with all of you this morning through the Internet. It's been such a wonderful experience to participate in this cohort, and I'm delighted to be able to share some of the things that we focused on on and learn through this process. Uh, so Bill Wilson Center, we're in Silicon Valley in Santa Clara County. And uh, similar to Edgewood, we have numerous programs. We've been in operation since 1973. We serve over 6,000 children, youth, young adults, and families uh, through counseling, education. We have foster care, juvenile probation and more, the program that I'll be focusing on today is our THP Plus program, where we have both scattered site and host home models. Since the implementation of AB12, the majority of our young adults are in the scattered site model, and we have a couple who who are in our San Jose State dorms model. So if they're a full-time student and attending San Jose State, they have the option to be in THP Plus while living in the San Jose State dorms. We also have our THP Plus foster care program, which is for those youth still in care under AB12, and we have 28 youth in that program. Some are in a single site model and others are out in the community and remote site very similar to the scattered site model of THP+. And about 25% of our youth in these programs are custodial parents. So we're very mindful of how we can best serve the unique needs of single parents in education. Uh, next slide, please. So why did Bill Wilson Center want to jump into this cohort and get involved? Why did we want to look at how we could have an impact and transform our programs with this focus on education. So really recognizing that uh, Bill Wilson Center as a whole, part of our vision is to eliminate generational poverty and recognizing that to be able to get out of poverty, you might be the first in your family to have gone to college, that really that path is through education beyond high school. Uh, we're in one of the most expensive places to live in not just our state, but in our country. And so how can we ensure that a youth is not having to work three minimum wage jobs just to pay the rent, uh, but has a, a better quality of life with a salary job, with a living wage? And to get them there, we have to do better with education. So recognizing that the challenges they're facing, be it that indeed they are the first in their family to go to college, that no one thinks they should go to college, that they might have some mental health or housing instability. They may have gone to 15 different high schools and are coming in feeling behind with their education. They may have had bad or traumatic experiences in school. Perhaps they had an IEP and they lost track of where they were at in that process and don't know what services are actually available. So we really wanted to be able to shift our focus from do they have a job or are they employed to what is their dream? What is their goal? Let's get them on a path to pursue a career for their life. Uh, rather than aimlessly saying, oh, I think I'll go to school. 
what are they going to school for? Let's make sure they're on a path to a better place. So while I feel we were already utilizing some of these methods already in our program, we really wanted to refine and improve those methods and see what are we doing that's working and what are we doing that could be improved. So having a toolbox that is very concrete to help us improve those outcomes. Uh, next slide, please. So where do we start? Again, I feel some of these uh, topics mentioned, we were doing to some degree, but we definitely had room for improvement. So looking at the academic focus case management, we were one of those programs that was already collecting progress reports and transcripts. Education was part of our monthly and quarterly goal programs we used with our youth, and yet there's a big difference between asking a youth, so how's school going? Oh, school's going great. And then next month, how's school going? Oh, well, I stopped going to class. I dropped out. Uh, school's just not for me. So recognizing that we needed to dig in with more open-ended questions uh, than where we were at. Um, one thing that we realized we could change was this work obligation for students. And that really uh, goes into the college going culture in the program. I think at the beginning, college had always been part of our program and a goal, but our main focus was work for these young people. The goal of never being homeless again is pervasive. And when you come out of crisis, when you come out of having lived in a tent, we wanted to make sure that that youth is never gonna live in a tent on the side of a road again. And so thinking, let's get you working, let's get you employed, let's get you with this income coming in, uh, was definitely our focus. So that's our, our red dot there. For, we were definitely not minimizing that work obligation. It was a requirement that all students work, even full-time students, we still require that they work uh, a little bit just so that they could have some income coming in besides our program. Uh, the other place where I feel we were less informed was with uh, avoiding placement and remediation. So uh, as a youth is getting enrolled in school, there's all these steps that we need to complete. The case manager would be there with them. And when it came to those placement tests, it was simply, here's where you go for your placement test. Let's make sure you signed up. I'll drive you there. But the test itself was really... Uh, up to the youth, whether or not they had breakfast that morning or had done anything to prepare was not necessarily a consideration. And so often they were ending up in remedial courses, uh, placing them far behind where they might need to be. Uh, next slide, please. So we set a lot of goals in this process. We were very ambitious really wanted to improve our case management style and also as a supervisor uh, in coaching and training the case managers, how can I improve so that the quality of the case management with regard to education is superior than it is right now. Uh, we wanted to make changes to the culture of our entire program to really prioritize education. Uh, one goal that was ambitious and ongoing is to really further develop close working relationships with our local campus support. In Santa Clara County, we have seven different community colleges that our youth potentially attend. And so we found that it was challenging to keep track of and maintain those relationships with so many different schools, particularly when the foster care liaison goes through staffing changes and we're used to working with one person and now it's another and it, it felt somewhat overwhelming to take that on. So that's more of a long-term and ongoing goal. Also to understand the financial aid process better. It is a confusing process and are we making sure that we uh, are not just having the youth fill out the FAFSA and leaving it at that, but really seeing them through. Um, and so you can see some of the other goals that we set there. So now let's talk about 
kind of what we learned and how things went. So where are we now? The academic case management has been uh, really exciting to see the changes. So understanding that it really does take time and it needs to be thorough. I really feel this is the, the meat of our, our progress and our improvement and outcomes. So just to say two years ago, um, if we look at the numbers of our youth who are in college, it's more more than doubled. And I think this case management piece is really integral to that. So rather than having one designated education specialist, we decided that we needed all of our case managers to become education specialists. And that part of the training and onboarding for this process would be for every case manager to have set foot on every single community college campus, to have met with the key people on that campus, uh, to the extent that we are starting to have some of our staff meetings at college campuses, having case managers meet the youth at the campus just for regular case management meetings, even if there's not a task that needs to happen, such as accompanying them to uh, EOPS to get signed up, just to make it easier for the student and to support the fact that they are a student and their life is on that college campus. Uh, looking at tutoring, I think that's something we were already doing well, but we found that the effectiveness of a tutor is not a given. So just as in anything, there are great tutors who are fabulous at what they do, and there are tutors who might not be the right fit for that particular youth. There is a chemistry that needs to be there, and ideally this tutor is somewhat trauma-informed, especially if they're working with a young person who might have some mental health considerations, uh, such as anxiety, or if there's a sensitivity to getting something wrong, then a tutor who comes on strong and says, no, that's not right, do it again, that could derail the entire tutoring session. So rather than a simple connection to tutoring, making sure that that was a good fit, checking in, how do you like your tutor? We had one youth who had been seeing a tutor for a while, but their grades were not improving. And we realized that this tutor was not a good fit. So we found another tutor and then suddenly the student is thriving in the class. So I think going above and beyond asking more detailed questions is all part of that academic focus, case management. Um, one of the easiest changes to make initially that is still an ongoing goal is that college going culture. So simply meeting with different colleges, gathering materials, posters, and putting those up in the office says something to the youth who's brand new to our program coming in for an interview. And if they see brochures for Cal works and getting on food stamps, those are important resources and those are still there, but they also see, look, here's a picture of a student who's been successful in their cap and gown. Here are uh, banners from the different colleges in my community. And I even had a youth in an interview who was not very set in their goals or sure what they wanted to do, and yet I'm asking them about goals. They literally looked up, saw the posters from the colleges, and said, you know, maybe I'm going to consider going to Mission College which is a community college in our county. So what an easy change. You, know, you could print out uh, materials online and just put them on the wall, and that alone says, this is a program that expects or believes that I have the ability to go to college. So let's see. What else would I like to highlight? Um, another ongoing goal is the close working relationship. So we are having staff come to our uh, staff meetings and also to our groups that we have with youth to increase the collaboration. It really helps for a young person on a college campus, which can be very big and intimidating, to be able to have a friendly face that they know where their office is and whatever it is they need, they know I can go to this person, even if I'm feeling very distraught, and they will help me. 
maybe they have a food voucher they can give me so I can get a meal at the cafeteria so I'm not going to my class hungry. Maybe I'm upset because I don't understand what's wrong with my financial aid and am I supposed to use this debit card? It's all very confusing. So having that key person that they can go to is key. The financial aid process is so confusing. And I really appreciated the webinar on financial aid. And I encourage any of you who haven't had a chance to listen to that to find it on the website. Making sure that the youth has gone through the entire process. When they complete the FAFSA, they are not done. There are many other steps they need to take. And there are many places along the way where they could fall into trouble. There are key deadlines that if they miss, they will suffer financially. So using tools like texting to make sure that they are following up with what they need to do in time to get the aid they are allotted. Uh, very exciting to realize that a youth who maximizes their financial aid applies for chafing, which is a separate application, and everyone doesn't always know that. If they're accessing scholarships, and even some of our youth did also take advantage of the retention grants, they might not need to work at all because there's a lot of money they can access if they really dig in and get into some scholarships. And how wonderful for a young person who might have some academic challenges or learning disabilities um, to be able to not have to worry about a job, even in the summer, to just be focused on school. So I think I'll stop there for now and leave uh, some time for questions with where Will Wilson Center is now. Thank you so much for allowing you to Ashley. share some of our journey with you. Thank you so much, both of you guys, for sharing about where your programs are and what you're working on. It's incredibly helpful to kind of have, hear what, you know, kind of the on the ground things that are happening. Um, and now we are a little behind in time. So what I'm going to do here is I am going to, we have a report it's posted on our website. It has all of the wonderful lessons learned that you see here on the screen in the report. I'm not going to, I'm not going to go over these in detail because you can read them. So I'm going to just mention one that I find very, um, very foundational. Um, and then the other ones you can read in the report. And it's the first one. You know, while providers were eager to improve college enrollment, retention, and completion among youth in their programs, the school and its related activities were not spelled out in the policies and procedures, right? Um, one thing that was for me an overarching takeaway was that of course people want their youth to go to college. Um, and there are these wonderful, great individual human beings that work with youth in these programs that have great practices and are really effective and support youth in their college endeavors. But at the end of the day, what happens when that staff member leaves, right? Um, does the whole program leave with them? You know, no, you don't want that to happen. So these practices have to be spelled out in the policies and procedures of the program. And this is what everyone in the cohort was, we were all finding was so key. Um, you know, just like other program rules and protocols that exist, there have to be protocols that, for supporting youth in college. And so um, to me, that was a very foundational thing. Um, you see a lot of other lessons learned here. Um, like I said, you can read all of these in the report. There's longer text about them. You can email me if you have questions. I'm gonna move on to where we're headed. So first, programs will engage executive leadership and stakeholders to assess how college is viewed and prioritized within their organization. Key, right? Um, next, this is what I was just talking about. Programs will incorporate the practices they utilize to support youth in post-secondary education into their policies and procedures manuals. Programs will implement protocol to train staff on post-secondary education related topics during the onboarding process. Um, programs will develop a deep understanding of the college matriculation process, and that was the process that includes the assessment test that we talked about. Programs will be informed about which colleges employ multiple measures and alternative strategies to address remediation needs, also in regards to these assessment tests. Um, and then programs will adopt a case management model that is academic focused and hands-on. Programs will establish or further develop their relationships with the local campus support programs. And programs will improve the use of technology to ease communication with campuses and promote college retention. This, we will be implementing the use of something called Persistence Plus. 
I'm not going to talk about that today, but you should go to their website and learn more, or you can learn a little bit more about it um, in our report. Um, but they are at persistenceplusnetwork.com, I believe. I hope that's correct. Persistenceplusnetwork.com. Um, and then uh, programs will assess their work requirement to determine its impact on college enrollment and retention. So kind of a lot of the stuff Ashley was talking about. Programs will assess how they can help prevent unintended pregnancy among these in their programs. So we didn't really talk about this today, but we can just briefly say when, when, when a youth has a child, it makes college a lot more difficult and a lot less likely. Um, so how are we doing all these things? Well, we have a second phase of the project, right? A, a phase two, it's a two-year project I mentioned, um, and we'll be uh, expanding the cohort to include a total of 40 providers one group will be those of the existing providers that continue to participate, and the other group will be new providers. We'll have new THP Plus and THP Plus FC providers, definitely adding those who focus heavily on serving probation youth. Um, we'll also be adding homeless youth providers, so providers that are not THP Plus and THP Plus FC providers that, that are serving homeless youth that do not necessarily have foster care history. This will be a two-year project, as I mentioned. Um, and if you're on the webinar and you think you might want to participate or you want more information, please send me an email. And my email will be at the end of the webinar. But it's Simone at JBA for youth.org. And if you're a county on the webinar and you think this would be a great opportunity for your providers, you know, email me and I'm happy to reach out to them or you can have them email me. Um, so we released this report I mentioned. Um, it's on our website. I will send it out. Uh, that's the link where you can find it. And uh, just lastly, I'm just going to say we do have this Burton Book Fund is now launched for 2017-18. I'm going to pass the slide, but you will receive a copy of this. So you'll get all this information on the slides, great information here sent to you. And there's information about this on our website. Um, and this is for current and former foster youth in college and also now homeless youth in college. So question and answer. I have some really good questions. I want to start with one that was... Um, for Ashley, and it is, um, or excuse me, no, I'm sorry, it is for Stephanie. Um, it's a two-part question. Were you able to transform your program with existing resources, so for example, just reorienting how those same resources were deployed, or have you found that you needed to find new resources, so like new funding? So basically, were you able to make changes with the existing funding you have? Um, right now yeah so the for us the funding is the same um, and again because they are more short-term um, wanted to focus our efforts on our strengths what we do have right so it, it meant getting really creative um, with uh, finding different ways that we can uh, that we can you know make this happen um, and so everything's still the same in regards to finances um, and it does mean just reaching out a little bit more um, and sometimes that means to Simone um, reaching out a little bit more and seeing like what else is out there um, and that's where that networking piece um, really comes into play um, because now you know now that we're connected we can easily connect to like right in front of Renaissance and they may know um, of more information so it's just a matter of, of reaching out and asking um, other providers too. Thanks, Stephanie. And this is the second part of the question. Did you have to change staff? So replacing those who didn't have skills oriented to promoting post-secondary education, or was this just a matter of retain, or, or were you, was this more of a matter of retaining, um, retraining, excuse me, that's where I'm missing, retraining existing staff? Yeah, so for us, it's a matter of retraining. We have really skilled um, case managers, and we want to for sure keep them. It's just a matter of everyone must be on the same page. So retraining is, is big for us right now. Great, thank you. Next question is, have pilot program participants shared with each other the materials, forms, internal processes, et cetera, that they created to help implement core practices so that there isn't a reinventing of the wheel? Um, yes, that, that did happen at some of the in-person um, convenings and also via the kind of conference calls we would then email around certain things. But I think for the next phase of the project, we'll have a little more purposeful, a little more organized way of doing this um, maybe there's one central kind of portal or Google share kind of place that, that everyone can share. Right now, it's kind of emailing around, so it's more informal, but I think that um, we'll formalize this a bit in the next phase of the project. Um, 
The next question is for Bill Wilson Center. Um, how did you make youth go to tutoring? Um, although tutoring is available, most don't take advantage of it. So I think the tutoring uh, comes out of some best practices and motivational interviewing. So the youth ultimately wants to do well. And when we're checking in more regularly with our weekly and monthly case management sessions, it will come out that they're having a struggle. I think it's helpful for the case manager to also normalize accessing tutoring. So for example, I might talk about, oh gosh, you know, I'm in social work. So when I took math, it was really difficult. And I probably bug my statistics professor every single day because I just didn't understand. And so making sure that we take the stigma out of accessing tutoring, normalizing that experience and uh, seeing it as, you know, if it's helpful, why wouldn't you? I think it also goes back to making sure they found a tutor that they like and feel comfortable with. So if it's someone that makes them feel stupid, they're not going to want to see that tutor. If it's somebody who they find incredibly boring, they're not going to want to see that tutor. So making sure that you've tried maybe a few tutors in order to find the right fit. And if anything else, we also like to use incentives wherever we can. So if there's some hesitancy to give something a try, then maybe we can throw in an incentive and see if that will help them be more motivated to give tutoring a try. Thank you. And another question for you, how do you hold the youth accountable to submitting transcripts and school schedules? So each youth is unique in terms of figuring out what strategy will be the most effective. But in general, when they're first coming into the program, they understand even in the interview what the program requires. And so we look at the benefits of the program and then the requirements. So I often talk about our program as having a job or having a second job. You're receiving rental support and food support, transportation support, and in exchange, you're required to do these things. So the issue sometimes, especially early on, is have they even figured out how to log on to their portal online and pull up their schedule and pull up their classes. So usually case managers have a laptop and hotspot with them out in the field. So they might say, oh, let's pull it up right now. Let's go ahead and log in on the computer and we'll get what we need right away uh, is another method that's been helpful. Thanks, Ashley. And I know we're at three minutes after, guys. I'm going to ask one more question for those who want to stay on for this last question because it's a good one. And then we'll close. Um, so last question, how does the time-limited nature of supportive housing programs for youth, in, how has that um, impeded your organization's ability to more fully become a college success program? It's a great question. Um, Stephanie, do you want to take that one? Oops, Stephanie, are you muted maybe? Sorry. Right. Yes, I'm good. <laughs> um, so that for us is, is always... Um, it's always a, a tricky um, thing. So um, it, that's why we really need to focus on um, on the goals. Um, and every adult is going to be very different. Um, so um, luckily, we have um, really, really great case managers um, who fit really well with uh, the adult. So um, yes, time is of the essence um, for them. And we constantly remind them of that during the program. Um, that is their time, and they, they can use it as much as they can, and they can use um, our services as much as they can. And we just always, always encourage um, to to use us um, because because our time is limited. So it's just a matter and of reminding you us. have an extra. Oh, I'm sorry. No, that's it. No, I was going to say you have an extra tool in your toolbox as well because you have the THP Plus extension for youth enrolled in school for an additional yeah. third year. Is that correct? Yeah, and that's true. Yes. Yeah. So they take advantage yeah, so of that for sure. Mm -hmm. And that's a kind of a plug for that that extension for counties who haven't opted into that. Great, um, great idea. It makes THP Plus just a little longer, and you can do just a little more with youth enrolled in school. So plug for that. Thank you for the person who asked that question. Um, and I think we are at 11:04. We're going to end. Thanks everybody so much for joining us.
please check the report out because there's so much that we couldn't cover in a webinar. It's just too much information that is all included in the report. And if you have any follow-up questions, feel free to email me. My email's on the screen there. If you're interested in getting involved in the next phase of this project and these efforts, um, reach out. And I hope you guys all have a wonderful rest of the week and a wonderful rest of the summer. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks, Ashley and Stephanie, for, for sharing everything with us today. Thank you. Thank you.